Um, hi, everyone. So first of all, um, good afternoon. I have a question for you. How many of you have implemented microservices in your organizations? A show of hands? OK, great. All right, so another question. Um, are microservices always the right solution when it comes to software design? Yes, probably not. Uh, a very few things in this world are always the 100% right solution, and microservices are no exception. However, if you're building complex applications for the cloud, then adopting a microservice architecture can maximize the return. But, OK, so once your architectural decisions are deeply vetted, and you do decide to go ahead with microservices, you also have to think about various concerns, like how are these microservices going to be um, accessed by client applications, how these microservices have to communicate with each other, and how are you going to manage these microservices as they grow from tens to hundreds to thousands of microservices. So in this talk today, API-driven microservice architecture, we are going to discuss um, how those concerns are going to be addressed. OK, so first of all, I'm going to start off with, a, with an analogy uh, which involves pebbles and boulders. Uh, it's an analogy that I borrowed from the Linux Foundation. I think it's a pretty cool analogy. So um, moving applications to the cloud should be as easy as walking down the beach and collecting pebbles into a bucket and moving them wherever you need, right? Wherever needed. A 1,000 ton boulder, on the other hand, cannot be moved easily at all. So as you rightly guessed, the 1,000 ton boulder represents the monolithic application. So the monolithic application comes with um, tightly coupled components tightly coupled components, um, they are almost, it's almost impossible to separate them. Uh, the monolithic application runs on very expensive hardware, and it's a nightmare to manage them. So if you look at the monolithic application, or the 1,000-ton uh, boulder, it's got sedimented layers of redundant features um, and logic, which is translated into thousands of lines of code written in a single, um, not so modern programming language based on outdated software architecture patterns and principles. So pebbles, on the other hand, are much easier to handle. You can easily group them, sort them based on um, color, shape, and you can easily relocate them. And yes, so the pebbles represent microservices. So microservices are loosely coupled services uh, built to serve a specific business function developed by a separate team using a programming language or technology that is best suited to develop that microservice. OK. Um, so because they're loosely coupled microservices or services, they can be updated and scaled independently and will not affect the rest of the application. And a failure in a, in the, in a microservice does not necessarily, uh, will not necessarily bring the entire application down. And a compromised microservice does not entirely mean, does not mean that the application is vulnerable, that the entire application is vulnerable. So we talked about why microservice architecture is a good approach to building decentralized systems for the cloud so far. But it also comes with its own set of problems. They are too granular, and it's complex when it comes to architecting larger systems. So one approach, uh, so one concern is how should client applications access these microservices? So using the API gateway pattern is one good approach. And based on this API gateway pattern, you can um, follow a layered architecture which segments your microservice architecture into layers. 
And alternatively, you can use the cell-based architecture approach. So we will be discussing how these architecture patterns can be implemented using open source technologies. OK, so in theory, the microservices can be directly accessed by the client applications because they expose public endpoints. But doing so will produce subsequent problems. So first of all, if uh, client applications directly talk to the backend microservices, you are going to face the point-to-point uh, -point spaghetti mess that the service-oriented architecture tried to eliminate with the use of an ESP. Then if there are mismatches between the needs of the client application and what the microservices return, then that means the client application will have to talk to, will have to make several calls to the microservices to get what it needs. And that could mean several hundreds of service calls in a complex application. Then the client applications will also struggle to consume uh, the microservices due to variations in interfaces and protocols because different teams are implementing these microservices using different technologies. Then at some point, these microservices will have to be refactored. And refactoring these microservices will be extremely challenging if the client applications are directly talking to them. And finally, um, if these client applications are directly talking to them, each of these microservices will have to take care of security, monitoring, throttling, and all, that, all those scenarios. So that means each of these microservices will have to worry about not only the business functionality that it's supposed to implement, but also about all of these other aspects that I just mentioned. So that creates duplication, and it's all redundant and unnecessary. So due to these kinds of problems, it really makes sense for client applications to directly talk to microservices. So a good approach to consider is to use the API gateway. It's also known as the backend for front ends. So here you can see, instead of talking to the backend microservices directly, the client applications are talking to the backend microservices through a single entry point, which is the API gateway. Uh, the API gateway will uh, have well-defined REST APIs that are fronting these backend microservices. So the API gateway will be responsible for request routing. It can um, do protocol transformations, and it can enforce security, throttling, and monitoring. And an API gateway is usually a part of an API management solution. So here you can see the mapping of the WSO2 API Manager's gateway on, uh, as the gateway in this picture. So um, the API gateway comes as part of uh, the entire API management solution, which also consists of uh, components like developer portals, key manager or the security component, uh, the traffic management component, and other components. So all of these components can be deployed in a single runtime or can be deployed as separate runtimes depending on your use case and your load requirements. The API analytics component is always uh, deployed separately. So this is the kind of API ecosystem that you can create with uh, the components of the WSO2 API Manager. So let me just quickly run you through what all of these components do and what the flow is like. So you have um, components fitting into a management plane, a data plane, and a control plane, right? So let's assume your developers have created their microservices. Now they want to expose these microservices as managed REST APIs using the WSO2 API Manager. So the API developers, or even the microservice developers themselves, can um, go to the API publisher, that's in the management plane, and add information about these microservices, like how to access them, what's a backend uh, endpoint. Um, you can add documentation, version the APIs, and also um, manage the lifecycle of that API. So all that's done through the API publisher portal. And then, um, let's say, the, so okay, so you can also publish those APIs into a developer portal. 
the application developers or the client application developers will be able to discover these APIs by logging into the developer portal. So they can find or discover services, uh, REST APIs, that they want to use in their client application. So they can subscribe to these APIs and also receive security tokens so that they can embed all of that and make sure that their client application can access that API. So you also get an analytics module in the management plane, which can provide valuable, valuable business insights to interested business stakeholders uh, who, are, who want to know information about uh, the API usage. So the control plane consists of a key manager, which is responsible for managing and validating security tokens. The traffic manager can uh, manage traffic and also there's an anomaly detection component which can um, detect anomalies and trigger alerts or notify interested stakeholders. So the gateway component resides in the data plane. So when the API consumers or the client application users uh, consume the applications, the API calls will hit the API gateway. And the API gateway during runtime will talk to the components of the control plane and finally dispatch the request to the backend microservices. So you can see that there are three different boxes here. Uh, the micro gateway and the Istio API adapter are also offerings that come with the API manager. So we will be talking about these two components in the upcoming slides. Okay, so we talked about using an API gateway to access your backend um, microservices, but uh, in most cases, like in most, in almost all cases, you're not going to be able to develop your microservices in a greenfield environment. There will always be applications that are suited for a, a monolithic architecture, or there are legacy applications that you don't want to refactor into microservices because it's too time consuming um, and it's too business critical to make any changes. So you would want to make your microservices talk to these legacy uh, applications. And that would require ESB functionality. You would want to do heavy transformations, heavy integrations, and implement enterprise integration patterns. So an API gateway alone would not suffice. So in that case, you instead of using a centralized ESB, which is an anti-pattern in uh, microservice architecture, you can instead use or create integration microservices, which will do the transformations or basically it will help you talk to the legacy applications as well as do orchestrations uh, for the microservice communications. So here you can see how we have used two different open source technologies to implement uh, integration microservices. So one is the Balrina programming language and we've also used the enterprise integrator uh, to create integration microservices. So let me explain or go into these two technologies now. Um, so Ballerina, as Shevan already explained, is a cloud native uh, programming language purposely built uh, for integration. So instead of um, configuring your integrations, you can write code to create your integrations. Right, so it's, uh, you can easily create your uh, interactions uh, because uh, this programming language is optimized for network distributed applications. It has native support for Docker and Kubernetes and um, uh, it has, uh, basically it's based on the fundamentals of enterprise integration patterns. So it's, um, uh, it, it's centered around sequence diagrams such that you can write your uh, co ballerina code or your integration code and you can visualize the code through sequence diagrams, right? So we, the ballerina was released, ballerina 1.0 was released just a few weeks ago and you could try it out. And the second option to create your integration microservices is to use the uh, WSO2's open source Enterprise Integrator 7.0. So Enterprise Integrator is the name that we have given uh, the ESB. WSO2's ESB is named as Enterprise Integrator. 
So the Enterprise Integrator 7.0 is not just an ESP, it's an open source hybrid integration platform. Uh, it's a hybrid integration platform because it provides runtimes, different runtimes uh, to create integrations. So in there's one integrator called the Ballerina integrator and another one called the micro integrator. So with the Ballerina integrator, you can create integration microservices using the code first integration style and it's based on the Ballerina programming language. So in addition to what you get with just the Ballerina programming language, the Ballerina integrator also comes with key Ballerina add-ons, predefined integration templates and protocol connectors that you don't get with just using the Ballerina language. And if you prefer the classic uh, configuration-driven uh, uh, configuration integrations, then you can use the micro integrator. So you can create integration microservices using the configuration first integration style. And this is the cloud native variant of the open source WSO2 ESB. So it supports all the ESB features. And it comes with the standard graphical data flow designer tools. So here you can see the two different editors that you can use. So if you want to go ahead with the Ballerina integrator and follow the code first approach, you can uh, code your integrations and you can visualize them uh, via the sequence diagram. And if you're more interested in creating your configurations using um, uh, drag and drop tools, then you can use the micro integrator. Okay, so uh, in the microservice architecture, Okay, microservice, microservices prefer decentralization in all aspects of software design. So we only discussed this far about an API gateway, which was a monolithic application, or it was just a centralized application, which could lead to um, the issues that you find in monolithic applications. So you can instead use a micro gateway. So a micro gateway is very useful when it comes to um, scaling so that it can scale along with the microservice that it fronts, rather than uh, a bulky API gateway being scaled, right? So WSO2 also provides a micro gateway. Uh, so the API manager comes with a micro gateway. So it, this can be easily used for microservice architectures, um, and they can be easily scaled because it does not maintain live connections with the components of the, con uh, of the control pane. Con control pane. So what you need to do is, um, so it's made possible because the micro gateway can do offline analytics. Um, it can also do in-memory uh, traffic control as well as it, can, it has support for self-validating the tokens. And the micro gateway also is very developer centric in that uh, uh, microservice developers themselves can create an open API specification for their microservices to create, um, to expose their microservices as REST APIs as part of their development flow. So you don't need to, they don't need to wait for another developer to come and expose these microservices as REST APIs. Okay, so next we will move to this question we often hear. Does the service mesh make the API gateway obsolete? So service meshes like Istio were introduced to reduce the complexity uh, of microservices by introducing a uniform way to connect, observe, secure, and monitor these microservices. So it does so by um, uh, injecting a sidecar proxy, which would talk to a control plane, um, and the control plane will basically um, intercept everything. So basically, it will receive all the uh, interceptions received by the service mesh sidecar. Um, so, so the API gateway and the service mesh um, can coexist complementarily because they solve different problems and they live at different levels. So they can exist independently, but they can coexist complementarily. So if you have um, an Istio service mesh already in place, what you can do is use Istio as the data plane and the control plane, and use the WSO2 API manager as the management plane. 
because the API manager can provide broader business value uh, by allowing uh, developers to create APIs, publish APIs using um, the API publisher and also monetize these APIs and also um, uh, use the WS3 API analytics components to create useful business insights. So the Istio mixer adapter of WS3 API manager can be plugged onto the mixer and then it can uh, talk to the management plane components of the WS3 API manager. So that's how the WS3 API manager can coexist with Istio. Okay, so what we discussed so far is the layered microservice architecture. So here you can see that the core business functionality is implemented in the, at the bottom layer. So they only focus on the business logic. And at the second layer, you get the composite services or the integration services, which takes care of all the integration aspects. Right? It could be connecting or orchestrating the microservices, or it could be connecting to legacy applications. And finally, at the top layer, or you get the API services or the edge services, which expose all of those as manageable, well-defined REST APIs so that the client applications can access your backend functionality. Okay, so that's all good. So this is Uber's microservice graph, uh, which was presented at a conference earlier this year. So it kind of looks scary because these are so many microservices with, um, it's not the number of microservices or the number of dots that's daunting. It's mostly uh, the far and wide connectivity, far and wide many-to-many -many connectivity that looks like it could uh, you know, create a significant governance challenge. So you're looking at this many microservices developed by uh, lots of teams, and that could you know, create issues with managing these microservices, especially when it comes to observability, team communications, and um, versioning them and discovering these APIs, these microservices. So this creates a need uh, for these microservices to be aggregated and to create higher level constructs. And this brings us to cell-based microservice architecture. So cell-based microservice architecture is also a microservice-based pattern, which proposes that microservices and other components, other functional components, like data sources, uh, front-end applications, serverless functions, um, uh, data stores, I, I don't know if I already mentioned that, yeah. So all of those can be grouped into cohesive, uh, individually deployable architecture units called cells, right? So they're self-contained and you can deploy them as a single unit and uh, they're API-centric in such that uh, you have a micro gateway or a cell gateway fronting um, or basically controlling access to all these components within a cell. And it comes with the data plane, which is the cell gateway, and the control plane. So the control plane will, cons will have a security token service and also have other policies on how these microservices should be accessed and so on. So if you implement a cell-based architecture where you aggregate your microservices and other components into higher level constructs, then this is what it would look like if you have all of those services and other components grouped into cells. So this is to give you a, a higher level picture. So more about the cell-based architecture. A cell is an immutable application component. You can build, deploy, update, um, and manage these uh, as complete units. And it can consist of multiple services, managed APIs, it has policies, uh, security policies, and you can define your dependencies and so on. So if the components within a cell want, want to communicate with each other, they can directly call these microservices and other components. But if you want to talk to a component residing outside of your cell boundary, then that component will have to talk to the cell gateway of um, that microservice. 
So cells can be versioned, pushed, pulled, deployed. They become reusable units of architecture. So if you want to um, implement a cell-based architecture on Kubernetes, you can use Celery, right? So Celery is an ongoing open source project that um, WSO2 started recently. It's a combination of, a, of an SDK, a runtime, and a management framework. So it allows you to write code to define cells, and these cells can be deployed on Kubernetes. So you can point to an existing Kubernetes cluster or Google, Cloud, uh, Google Kubernetes engine, and you can create these cells easily by writing type safe compile code. So you don't have to write your microservice definitions within this cell file, right? You just have to point to existing microservice uh, container images of your microservices. And then basically um, say how these applications or how these microservices should communicate with each other and what are the external dependencies and so on. So once you compile this code, it will create the corresponding Kubernetes artifacts. So you don't have to worry about writing YAML configurations. So in this picture, you can see that um, you can write the cell description using Celery, so that's all code. And uh, once you uh, commit that cell description file into a source, uh, into a version control repository, uh, you can um, use a CI CD server like Jenkins to build that code for you and basically build the cell image. You can test that cell image and push it to a uh, container image repository. And during runtime, you can uh, pull that cell image and um, have everything deployed on Kubernetes. So underneath all of it, we have Kubernetes, Istio, and Celery working to create all these cells for you. Uh, and just like any other Kubernetes application, you can monitor, trace, and secure um, your uh, cells. Okay, so this brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, to recap, microservice architecture is great, but uh, they're too granular and they need to be managed systematically when it comes to architecting larger systems. So um, a good way to allow your client applications to access your microservices is to use the API gateway. And based on the API gateway, you can follow the layered architecture approach for better management where you segment your uh, microservices into uh, layers. And for even more complex systems, cell-based architecture is an emerging alternative that can help at organizational and DevOps levels. So for more information, um, you can refer to these publications. So uh, API-driven microservice architecture is a, is a white paper. So this presentation is based on that. Um, and for more information on cell-based architect architecture and why, you, why there is a need for cell-based architecture, so these, the second and the third link will be useful. And if you want to know more about Celery, uh, you can take a look at this uh, InfoQ article, uh, which makes use of the Google Hipster Shop application um, to create cells, and it will show you uh, a sample for you. So finally, what I have to say is um, microservices can be daunting, uh, but if there are ways and means to manage them systematically, so seize the day with microservices and don't, I mean, be afraid to um, collect your pebbles. And yeah, thank you. <laughs>